Colin Marshall here, letting you know that the Marketplace of Ideas World Headquarters is just about to move to Los Angeles, California. So, Los Angelino listeners, you have your mission. If you have any radio stations you particularly enjoy listening to there that you think you might want to hear the Marketplace of Ideas on, let me know at Colin at ColinMarshallRadio.com. That's Colin at ColinMarshallRadio.com. Send me your favorite Los Angeles pro tips. Thanks. Reading your book, I thought back to an observation I had about just a group of friends I was with a while ago, and I noticed that there was this preponderance of, of friends with an interest in both evolutionary biology and economics, specifically you know, the way things evolve and the way markets work. And I wondered why this could be, and I'm guessing, based on the based on the things you've written and thought about, that you have an answer why someone might be interested in both those things. Yes, I mean, there's quite a close analogy. I mean, some people think that there's almost a precise analogy between evolutionary biology and the way a market works. I wouldn't go so far, but I think it's very illuminating. Basically, in evolutionary biology, uh, incredibly complex things evolve through a really blind process of variation and selection. The variation comes about uh, largely because of mutations and because of um, mixing during uh, sexual uh, reproduction. And the selection comes about because, well, some of the results don't work so well. You know, many mutations don't produce good results. Um, and so you have survival of the fittest in Darwin's uh, famous phrase. Actually, I think the phrase actually came from Galton, but the famous phrase used to apply to Darwin's theory of evolution. And hey, presto, you have is this incredible diversity of life on Earth produced by this simple process, variation and selection. Now, let's think about how the economy works. Well, you certainly have variation. Uh, entrepreneurs and uh, also, to be honest, middle managers in corporations are always producing new ideas, scientists producing new ideas as well. And um, uh, that's the variation. And then the selection mechanism comes in science through peer review and other scientific processes. And in the market, the selection mechanism comes through customer preferences, and bankruptcy. If you have a, if you set up a, um, I don't know, a, a, a shop to make uh, stuffed puppies and nobody <laughs> buys the stuffed puppies, well, you'll go out of business. If, on the other hand, you have a concept for Starbucks or the search algorithm behind Google, then um, that idea is going to spread and spread and spread. So there is a pretty strong analogy between the two. From KCSB in Santa Barbara and Colin Marshall Radio, I'm Colin Marshall. This is the Marketplace of Ideas, and my guest is the undercover economist himself, Tim Harford. You might know him from his columns, Dear Economist and The Other Undercover Economist, the BBC shows More or Less, and Trust Me, I'm an Economist, or the books The Undercover Economist, The Logic of Life, which he discussed on this show a few years back, and now adapt which covers some of the subjects you've talked about right in that opening response now i was trying to contextualize adapt in this this trilogy of books i've just mentioned i'll I'll go ahead and label it that and the first one the undercover economist i thought is one, one of my favorite books of the of what i would consider to be the popular economics boom in the mid 2000s the logic of life which we talked about on this show was a, a bit of a transition it had one foot in that one foot somewhere else how does this book fit into the ideas you've already been publishing on well i suppose i wrote it backwards is the answer or maybe i wrote it forwards and i wrote the other ones backwards <laughs> so both undercover economist and logic of life were books completely rooted in economics. I said, economics is interesting, and economics has things to say about the world. In The Undercover Economist, it was, it was about the way commerce works, um, the, about the rise of China, about why Africa is poor, all, all the ideas that you might regard or, uh, as economic ideas and try to explain why they were interesting and what economists had to say about them. Logic of Life took those ideas, 
beyond the market, beyond the sphere of commerce, and looked at uh, marriage and discrimination and crime and the rise of cities and things like that. Um, but with ADAPT, I started from a very different place. I didn't start with economics. I started with the world. And in particular, I wanted to write a book. Initially, this sounds naive, but I, I started off wanting to write a book about how to save the world. So we've got problems out there. Right. And we've got wars. We've got uh, climate change. We've got, uh, I think, a technology slowdown. I think we can make the case for that. We've got very poor countries. Of course, we've got a financial crisis. So I wanted to write a book about how problems like this get solved. And it was, and I assumed the answer would be economics. And of course, economics does have something to contribute. But in the end, the answer turned out to be not economics, not any particular academic discipline, but trial and error. Because these are incredibly complex problems. And I argue in the book, they, they never get solved first time. It's impossible to solve them on a purely theoretical basis. You can only solve them by getting out there, getting your hands dirty, and inevitably making mistakes. This seems to address one of these common criticisms of economists, which I would hear thrown around at least a few years ago. I'm not sure I agreed with them, but people would say, oh, economists, you know, everything works for them in theory. But what about practice? What about practice? What about the real world? Don't, uh, doesn't, doesn't nothing any economist ever says apply in the real world? You know, I, I never thought that was right. But in a sense, this, would you say there's maybe a supplementing of economic theory going on in the kind of material you write about in ADAPT? Well, certainly what I write about is, is not at all limited to, to economics. Um, I mean, it's really rooted in narratives about how real-world problems were solved. So anything from how the Spitfire, uh, which is a plane that really helped to, to defeat the Nazis in World War II, how the Spitfire was developed against all the odds, to uh, how uh, the U.S. Army reinvented its strategy in the war in Iraq from the bottom up. So I'm, I'm starting with case studies and um, finding whatever theory uh, I can to explain what happened, if a theory is appropriate. I have to say, I, I think yeah, you say you didn't believe that criticism, criticism of economics. I think there is some truth in it. Uh -huh. And when I think about the financial crisis, what I've learned is not that or oh, um, you know, economists need to uh, surrender to behavioral economics and psychology is everything, or uh, you know, we need we need more sophisticated physics-based mo um, models of economics, or this or that. It, it wasn't any specific thing like that. It wasn't that there was any specific theory that would have fixed the problem. I mean, the, these theories do have something to contribute. It was the details that mattered. If economists who were writing about finance had paid enough attention to the details of the way these contracts were working, the details of how these markets work, I think they would have realized that something was wrong. The problem wasn't so much the theory itself. There was nothing wrong with the theory. It's just the theory, because it was a simplification, lulled economists into thinking, well, they didn't need to understand the details. And it turns out the details mattered. And that's not just true of, of economics. I mean, to pick another example that might seem very different, structural engineering it's very easy to structurally engineer, or it seems very easy to structurally engineer a building based on principles of engineering, principles of physics. And often we find really innovative buildings run into problems, they fall down, um, they develop stresses, they develop problems. And it's always some small thing you didn't think about, that, such as the geology of the area or snow drifting at an angle rather than falling straight down. Um, and these are the things... It wasn't the theory that was wrong. It was the practical experience of understanding the subtleties of the situation that was wrong. Now, just to make this absolutely clear, it is fascinating because I, I would see articles or I'd see opinion pieces in the aftermath of the whole financial crisis, the financial meltdown, talk about how, oh, well, economic theory has just been disproven. We're going to have to tear this down and start from scratch. But it did seem to me, and tell me how right or wrong I am about this, that the theory was not so much the problem, and perhaps this is what you just said, but it was a misunderstanding of the situation. Economic theory applied here, but it applied to a different situation than we all initially might have thought it was? I think that's true. Economic theory is a simplification. It encourages simplification. That's why it's powerful. 
And I think it just encouraged people not to notice the kinds of contracts that were being written. When you, when you actually see the sorts of contracts were being written, it isn't very hard to apply economic theory and understand uh, why there were problems. But I, I'm, what I will admit, I will freely admit, is it's not necessarily obvious that economics is the discipline you need to study, for instance, the financial crisis, or not the, not the only discipline you need to study the financial crisis. One of the things I learned as I was writing the book was um, there are psychologists and sociologists and even safety engineers studying complex, failure-prone, fragile systems, tightly coupled systems, you might call them, such as oil rigs, which are, of course, at risk of explosions, as we saw with Deepwater Horizon, or nuclear power stations. We remember Three Mile Island, more recently, uh, Fukushima in Japan. Um, I actually talked to the, the people who studied these kinds of systems because I felt actually understanding how to make those systems as safe as possible, oddly, as it may seem, will tell you something about how to make the financial system safer because there, there are some quite powerful analogies there. You do, you, you do draw from a pretty wide range, I would say, of current events. You know, you, you mentioned that the Iraq War is involved in this book. You, you draw examples from there. Deepwater Horizon, you mentioned the financial crisis. There's historical examples as well, as you mentioned, the design of the Spitfire being an example of adaptation of the kind you talk about. But it seems like, I get the impression from the book, we live in a very rich time for this kind of thing happening on a huge scale in the media. Is that correct or... Did you just were you just good at picking examples? I think the world has become more complex, and that makes trial and error more important. I, I suspect it's always been complex, but um, you know it certainly isn't getting any simpler. Uh, certainly, one example, uh, one area I looked at in the book was the area of innovation, and there's a very interesting debate going on at the moment as to is innovation speeding up or is it slowing down, and um, I guess my response to that is, well, I, I, I don't know. I don't know if that question is actually well-formed. I don't know if that question really tells you what you need to know. But, but I do know one thing, which is that when you look at the, the micro data on innovation, when you look at patent citations or art, scientific articles, what you find, this is research by an economist called Benjamin Jones at Kellogg, what you find is that the teams that produce those patentable inventions or produce those scientific papers, they're bigger than they used to be. They are older than they used to be. They're older scientists. They're more specialized than they used to be, or at least each, each individual is more specialized. He's less likely to be cited in a patent in a different field. Um, so you've got these, these larger, more specialist, um, more focused, more experienced teams seem to be now required to produce scientific innovation. And what that tells you, and I think this is perfectly intuitive when you think about it, is innovation has become a more complex organizational problem. It's become more expensive. Now, more expensive is no problem because we're richer than we were 20 years ago or 50 years ago, so we can afford to pay more for innovation. But a more complex organizational problem, bigger teams, more specialized teams, that's not so clear that we've really done the thinking that we need to do to figure out how to get the most out of teams. We, we sort of, we have two different technologies, if you like, two different institutions for promoting innovation. We have governments which provide grants and fund universities, and we have the private sector with patents and venture capital. And my perception is the private sector is very good at, at pluralism, lots and lots of different ideas. It tends to be quite small and quite short term. So if your different ideas will deliver a quick return, you know, things like Facebook, Google, the whole Silicon Valley thing, that's great, no problem. The public sector has the money and has the long-term vision to fund what's really important, you know, clean energy systems, cures for malaria or HIV. But the public sector is not so good at this pluralism, not so good at this diversity, um, tends to be rather conservative. After all, they are spending your money and my money, so maybe they should be conservative. So I look in the book at... Is there a way that we can combine the best of those two worlds? With pluralism, with diversity, I mean, along with that, as you lay out in the book, comes a lot of failure. The more things tried, the more failures are going to happen. And 
obviously, as you just said, the government is is somewhat less tolerant of having failures on their hands. Are they are they uniquely intolerant of that though, or is there a whole is there a whole section, a whole swath of human endeavor that needs to be, in your mind, more tolerant of failure than it is? I think most of our institutions need to be more. Um, it's not just more tolerant of failure because you can you can tolerate failures and then get nothing out of those failures. You can have destructive failures rather than constructive failures. Um, but yeah, I think there are whole swathes of our institutions that are um, not designed to get much out of failure. They try and avoid failure, and when there is a failure, they um, they don't learn from it. Um, so I don't think it's unique to politics. I think there are really two things going on here. One is some basic psychology, um, which we could talk about later perhaps, but there are certain psychological reasons why we as individuals don't like failure. And then organizationally, um, the incentives are all wrong. So contrast the incentives for a politician with the incentives in a market. So in a market, you have 50 failures and one success. But if that success is, say, General Electric, that's, that's worth the 50, 50 failures. Those failures are small. Um, they, they don't waste a lot of resources. They're companies that live and die early. And you, the successes become tremendously influential ideas. So no problem. 50 failures to one success, that's a perfectly acceptable ratio. Um, I think something similar is true in science. You have a lot of failed experiments, a lot of failed theories, one breakthrough, and you're making progress. Now think about the incentives for a politician. He knows or she knows that you can have 50 policies that are working fine and no one is going to notice. It is the one failure that will create the narrative for the next election campaign. That's what the media will talk about. That's what your opponents will talk about. And so a politician, and I, I might include people, you know, other a broad definition of politics. So we're thinking of office politics, we're thinking of corporate hierarchies and so on. But a politician will know, given those are the odds, you want to be very conservative, you want to do as few things as possible. And when you do do things, you want to make sure you don't define what success looks like. And above all, you don't want to evaluate whether you had a success or not. Uh, because you know that the moment one of your evaluations proves there's a problem, it's very difficult for you politically. And following on from the issues of the the definition, shall we say, of success and how in some in some cases, especially politically, you might want to have that be a hazier definition than elsewhere. You know, a lot of a lot of what I was thinking about reading this book is the definition of failure, and I'm sure it's something that went back and forth in your mind as well, writing it. You use this classic Samuel Beckett quote, ever tried, ever failed, no matter, try again, fail again fail better. And that seems to get at something about the definition of failure that people don't normally think about when they're thinking about failure. I mean, there must be there must be ways we can all conceive of failure that is more to our advantage in our minds, are there not? Well, yeah. I mean, here's a very positive example of failure. It's almost absurdly positive, but um, you... Uh, you have a new medicine. You want to know whether it works. It turns out there are many, many ways that we can deceive ourselves into thinking that something is effective when in fact it's not. And so the medical profession has evolved over time a very rigorous set of procedures designed to test new medicines. And the most important, the keystone of those procedures, although they're not, it's not the only part, is the randomized controlled trial. You will give your treatment to a thousand people uh, and you will give a placebo to another thousand people or you may give you may give them something other than placebo you may give them a, the best alternative treatment or whatever but let's say you give them the placebo so you've right you've given the treatment to a thousand people and you've given the placebo to a thousand people what is that if not a rigorously controlled failure yeah you've got a thousand sick people and you're giving them a sugar pill you know it's not going to work. And yet, this is the foundation of medical progress. The randomized controlled trials have saved 
literally hundreds of millions of lives. That's a way of conceiving of failure that makes it sound entirely constructive and entirely helpful and entirely unproblematic because most failures in our lives are a little bit more traumatic than that. If you've just tuned in, this is the Marketplace of Ideas, and I am your host, Colin Marshall. My guest is the undercover economist himself, Tim Harford, back on the program to talk about his new book, Adapt, Why Success Always Starts with Failure. If when this conversation is over, you want to hear it again, it's very simple. Visit ColinMarshallRadio.com or iTunes, your application of choice, and you'll find the complete Marketplace of Ideas interview archive in either place. All the shows we've ever done free for the download and listen and re-listen and re-listen wherever you want to listen to them. That's ColinMarshallRadio.com or on iTunes, just search for the Marketplace of Ideas. Now, without further ado, back to the conversation with Tim Harford on the Marketplace of Ideas, cultural conversation of the depth you demand. There's a line toward the end of the book that, you know, when I think about individual failure, I think of this line, which is, and I want to try to remember it correctly, but that populations adapt, systems adapt, individuals can succeed without necessarily themselves adapting. What does that mean in this context? So I'm trying to be realistic here. I would like to promise easy answers for everybody. But the truth is, while you can have a system like the market system where you have 100 failures and one success, and that's okay, from the point of view of society, that's very productive. From the point of view of the individuals involved, um, you, know, the, you may not get the chance to have 100 failures before you succeed. You may just have failed and just have you know, a life that's not what you hoped it would be. I mean, in, fortunately, we're, you know, we live in rich countries those failures are probably not going to be deadly, but they might be a bit depressing. Um, in natural selection, failure means you get killed. Um, you can see a population adapting. You can see a species evolving, but the individual members of that species are just getting killed. So my, um, the point I wanted to make is that while we can, to some extent, you know, in our everyday lives, use some of the principles I describe and adapt, it's not going to be a panacea for the point of view of the individual because you can't, you can't be like, Google can try a thousand things and hope that a hundred of them work. You can't try a thousand things and hope that a hundred of them work. And so I'm just trying to be realistic. Now, you have so many fascinating examples of adaptation, many of which we've discussed, some of which we haven't discussed yet. But in the book, I mean, you, you look at these, you examine these, you tell us where we can see adaptation at work in all these examples, historical and from current events. And then you have the chapter at the end of the book called Adapting and You. And given what you've just said, you know, I want to ask, is there, writing a book like this, is there, I don't, I don't know what source this would come from, but is there a pressure to then, maybe pressure is even the wrong word, but to then bring the conclusions or questions or whatever you arrive at to the reader's level and say, here's how you might be able to employ this? Yeah, well, I put that pressure on myself. Ah. Um, and it was partly the, the process of writing the book where, uh, and you're absolutely right, it's, it's not a self-help book. There's a, there's a chapter on the financial crisis, there's a chapter on the war in Iraq, a chapter on climate change, a chapter on innovation. I mean, it's not a book about, you know, how, you know, you and I can learn from our mistakes. It's about the systems that we build and the institutions that we build to solve complex problems. But nevertheless, you get to the end of the book, and you know, well, I got to the end of the book, and I, I, I thought to myself, well, how? I feel I have learned something in the process of writing this book. I think there is, there, there is advice that will be effective for individuals, even though it's not quite what I'm talking about, even though you, know, we can't, you cannot just be like Google or be like uh, the American army uh, in solving your own personal problems. So... That was, the, that was why I wanted to finish off by trying to reflect on what it meant for individuals. And I should point out the, that, that chapter is half the length of each of the other chapters. It's almost nice. an afterthought, um, an epilogue perhaps. Um, but still, I feel, I feel there are some individual lessons. So looking at the psychology of failure, it turns out there are many, many ways in which we tend to 
respond in very unhelpful ways to failure. So I interviewed poker players for the book. The poker players told me, uh, immediately after you've failed, either through your own error or because of bad luck, immediately after you've lost a lot of money, you are very vulnerable at the poker table. Poker, ta poker players call it going on tilt. You start to do irrational things to try to get your money back. Of course, it's not your money anymore, but effectively you chase your losses, and in chasing your losses, you increase your losses. And we're, surely we've seen that in, well, we see it in politics all the time. Politicians determine not to let go of an idea, so they subsidize it and push it, because otherwise they'd have to stop and do a U-turn, and a U-turn is toxic in politics. We see it in our personal lives as well. You see, you see the people who, who, who will not give up on the relationship. They're convinced that if they, they just give it one more try, it's going to work. Um, who just will not change career when you can see that the, they're never going to make it in the career they have and a bit of extra effort is not going to be the solution. So we see this sort of behavior, and there are many other examples of behaviors which I, I tried to understand because they were relevant to the case studies in the book. I mean, and that, in every case study, there's a, there's a hero, there's a human story about trying to experiment against the odds. Um, but once I'd studied that psychology and understood some of that, I felt, well, it, it's clearly relevant to our everyday experience. I, I should try and reflect that in the end of the book. These elements of psychology that bear on the questions discussed, I mean, whether they're economic questions or, or what have you, they they do bring to mind, you know, a lot of people have been talking about behavioral economics lately, and that, even the name of that discipline or sub-discipline has always struck me as a little bit odd because there there is more, there's more working of psychology into the analysis, sure, but the phrase behavioral economics it sounds wrong because to me, economics never involved anything other than behavior. Do you know what I mean? I know exactly what you mean, but I mean, that, of course, is, it was a very clever name because the name itself was an implicit criticism of what behavioral economics was trying to challenge. Mm. It implied that standard economics did not reflect human behavior and was not behavioral. Um, so it was, you know, it was a, it was a clever naming trick. I think um, behavioral economics has told us quite a lot, but it's still a science in you know, very, very early days. We have a lot of experiments that um, people love to write about in books like mine um, that have, have not been replicated. Uh, we don't have a proper register of the trials that haven't taken place because social science just hasn't um, or not the trials that haven't taken place, but the trials that haven't been published. So you do treat you do two experiments, one produces a really interesting result and you get to publish it in the top journal. The second experiment produces something really boring and you don't necessarily hide the result, but you know, you know it's not going to be published anywhere interesting, you don't have a lot of energy to publish it. That kind of thing affects all science and, and I think it affects particularly the social sciences by which I would, I would include behavioral economics. So it's a young discipline that... Um, really needs to be supported and nurtured, but I do not think it's the last word on economics at all. There are so many other things going on that are worth paying attention to. Now, in this respect and others, as far as the way you approach these questions in ADAPT, you know, one gets the sense of disciplines crossing each other's borders, techniques going from one discipline to another, ideas moving from one to another, and as well in the subject matter, because you talk about such a wide range of types of adaptation, be it in be it in uh, fighter plane design, be it in the financial markets, be it in medicine, or, or in choreography, for example, there's just this cross-pollination is not quite the metaphor I'm looking for, but there's a lot of, a lot of boundaries breaking down between ways things had been intellectually carved up. It seems like this points towards something in the way people think about things in general. That's a little bit grand, but do you, do you know what I mean? Do you sense, do you sense those, the, the increasing uh, prevalence of those ways of thinking, those techniques of analysis pointing in, in a direction? I wish I was as confident as you that that was going on. Um, uh. You know, an idea that I'm thinking about for my next book is to try to understand uh, 
why the why this cross disciplinary fertilization is so difficult because it, it really is. I have studied it a little um, for my columns, and what you discover is to the, the institutions of science, such as peer review, work on um, hierarchies and networks of reciprocity. So, you know, you, you do free peer review for a journal because you want to be respected by that journal. Um, you want to be part of that, in, uh, that industry, that academic field. Then a, a journal from another field comes and says, well... Say, you, say you're an epidemiologist. I, I had a case like this I actually wrote about, and a correction had to be published in the end as a result of my investigation. But say you're an epidemiologist. Um, an economics journal comes to you and says, we've got a very exciting paper written by an economist about epidemiology, but we don't know about epidemiology, so we don't know whether she's got it right. So can you, can you have a look at the paper and tell us? And the epidemiologists will basically say, well, I'm sorry, I'm busy <laughs> doing, doing epidemiology papers for the epidemiology journals. You guys have got nothing to offer me. That's basically the conversation. So at an academic level, these things are really difficult. And I think it's a really interesting problem to think about um, how to better integrate these disciplines. Um, as, an, as a writer, I'm in a privileged position. I'm, I'm starting to discover... And I keep learning and adapting as I go along, but I, I'm starting to discover the incredible power of narrative. Um, more and more as I write my books, I'm trying to tell a story. Uh, I try to have a protagonist. I try to drive things forward. And there are a couple of reasons for that. One is that the story has its own power and, and it's fun to read a story. Even if, even if you're trying to get the ideas in, you're trying to get the theories in, we all remember stuff better if there's a story to it. You know, everything from Isaac Newton and the apple. and you know, we, we just remember the stories. That's how we're built. But the second thing is, the story forces you across disciplines. Because rather than simply trying to explain how a particular economic idea works, which I might have done in Undercover Economist, I'll get an economic idea and I'll try and create, I'll try and create illustrations for that idea. Instead, you have to follow the story. You have to follow the, prota the protagonist, the 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 Nobel Prize winning uh, biomedical researcher who started off, his first memory was of his, his mother being taken to a concentration camp, or the, the colonel who took these career-threatening risks uh, and, and forced the U.S. Army to adapt from the bottom up. You follow these people through their stories, and that forces you, as you're telling the story, to move from history to sociology to psychology to economic theory and back again because that's where the story takes you to, ex to give some theory that explains what's just happened. You know, you, you're forced across disciplines and, and I've realized that's almost an, an accidental byproduct, but it's, it's wonderful. Now, when I think of narrative, I think of it as something like salt in that when you're making something, the, the narrative is a necessity because, like salt, without it, a human being can't last very long. But also, like salt, if you go a little bit over the line, you render the dish inedible. I want to know, is there a point in your mind where narrative goes too far? How do you avoid crossing that point if there is? You, you're always wrestling with that um, because the narrative is maybe putting you in one direction and convenient theoretical explication, maybe pulling you in another. There may be messy details that complicate the picture that emerge from the narrative. Or you're sort of t you're, you're, so you're asking yourself, um, the story takes me one direction, or the story asks to be told in a particular order, whereas um, explaining the theory would take me in a different order. And I don't, I don't, think, there's, um, I don't think there's an easy answer to that. It's very interesting to... to observe people who do it very well. So Malcolm Gladwell, um, I'm a bigger admirer of his, of his writings. I know uh, he's hugely admired by some people and other people you know, don't like his stuff, but <laughs> he's a master at, at weaving the, the theory in with a narrative. Uh, but there is always this risk that the narrative takes over. Um, but you know, that's something I wanted to try. I wanted to try and, and, and challenge myself. I think personally... I'm a theory kind of guy. I always instinctively go for the idea, the academic idea first, and the story, the character second. 
So I figured if I tried to push myself towards the narrative, I would probably end up in a happy medium. Now, take us back a few years, the better part of a decade, I suppose, in your own narrative, to where you're working at, I believe, Shell Oil, and you have discovered, correct me if I'm wrong, the capacity to begin an experiment of your own on the side, writing writing what became the Undercover Economist. What, what was the nature of that experiment when you began it? So, this is, I mean, in retrospect, it's absolute case study for how to adapt in your personal life because I didn't think about it or realize it consciously at the time. So I'm working for a a very strange part of Shell uh, that's full of cross-disciplinary theorists and practitioners whose job is to analyze the economic, social, technological, and political risks facing Shell. And we often used scenario analysis, sort of futurology. But that, that, that was just the tool. The basic idea was what are the risks facing this company and how do, we, how do we respond to them? So it was very satisfying in many ways because I was surrounded by very smart people, cross-disciplinary. It was a wonderful preparation for being a writer. But of course, you had all the frustrations of being in a very large company. A lot of the company thought we in that particular unit were, were you know, pretty crazy, not very <laughs> useful. You give a lot of presentations that would be beautiful presentations and didn't seem to change anything. So I was wrestling with that and trying to work out what to do. And then uh, a consultant was hired into the team for a week to get us thinking about new technology. And his name is David Badanis. Uh, he wrote a great book called E equals E squared. Um, so he's a great science writer. Uh, he's written many successful books since. And I said to David, wow, you've just written this amazing book about the, the people and the history of physics. Wish I could write a book like that about economics. <laughs> and David sort of... I would say he looked at me as though I was stupid, but he he, he's not like that. He's always relentlessly cheerful and supportive. He just sort of said, well, what's stopping you? Why don't you do it? And then I realized that I had the opportunity to take a, an experiment that really had no downside. I persuaded my boss that I could take two mornings a week off, so effectively work a four-day week. I had a reduced salary, of course, but I, you know, I had, it was an oil company, and you know, I still had enough money to get by. And... Those two mornings, I wrote this book over the course of a year, which was called The Undercover Economist. It took me years to get it published, but I remember telling my, my wife, she was just my girlfriend at the time, when I finished that final page, you know, I, I don't know whether anyone will ever publish this book, but it was worth it. I just, I just had such fun on those mornings when I didn't have to go into the oil company and it, you know, if there'd been some, it was a, it was a generally a nice place to work, but sometimes there were some office politics, there were some problems, and you would you would just go in and you'd say, I don't care, I wrote fifteen hundred words this morning. You guys can't can't touch me. I've got something else I'm working on. And clearly, not everybody can can do that. Not everybody has that opportunity. I was very lucky in many ways, but it was a, a textbook example of taking a, a small bet, a, 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 a risking a failure that actually was never going to do you any harm because I, I enjoyed the process. I was learning from the process and, you know, I lost a little bit of money, but even if the book had never been published, I just felt, well, it was a, that was a failure worth making. And of course, it did get published and about a million people bought it. So uh, in the end, that worked out pretty well. But even if it hadn't, I think it would have been useful. Now, something interesting happens here on an individual level with this type of experiment, because as you mentioned, you know, you enjoyed not going into shell those mornings, writing, learning about, learning more about the subject than even you knew already, I would presume, writing the book. And, you know, correct me if I'm being too bold about it, but it sounds like it had then succeeded before you ever shipped the first manuscript out because you had gotten more enjoyment than you perhaps would have from the money you would have made on those mornings. Yeah, that, that's absolutely true. I mean, of course, it may have been that I would have discovered while writing the book that I hated writing books. I mean, there are people who aspire to write a book. I know many people aspire to write a book, and then when they start, they realize it, they hate it. Well, in that case, I'd say, well, fine, well, you learn something, you'd better stop and uh, do some other experiment. But I think that life is rich in these sort of, sorts of experiments, um, not just writing a book, could, could be anything, you know, anything from uh, a cookery course to um, deciding you're going to organize a, 
uh, book club. I mean, it doesn't have to be a big deal. I think we hesitate to do these things because we fear that they might not work and we are disproportionately sensitive to small failures. This is a finding that comes out of behavioral economics. Even a mild inconvenience, a mild embarrassment, a small financial loss, we get very uptight about it. And so one of the messages of that epilogue of the book is, well, maybe we should be a little bit more relaxed and recognize that these failures are perfectly survivable. And if there's a possible upside, if that cookery course or that book group is going to lead to something that's enjoyable and really enriches your life, um, if there's a chance of that, it's worth risking the failure. Just tuning in, this is the Marketplace of Ideas, and I'm Colin Marshall. I'm speaking today with Tim Harford, the undercover economist himself, author of a new book called Adapt, Why Success Always Starts with Failure. If you want to be kept up on all things MOI, new interviews, old interviews, upcoming interviews, current interviews, all kinds of related internet interestingness, it's so simple to sign up for the Marketplace of Ideas mailing list. For all the details, and there are only a few, and they're very easy to understand, I assure you, go to ColinMarshallRadio.com. That is ColinMarshallRadio.com, and the instructions on the Marketplace of Ideas mailing list are all right there on the front page. Now back to the conversation with Tim Harford on the Marketplace of Ideas, cultural conversation of the depth you demand. Now, what was it that, if you can even identify this, what was it that brought you over that bump of, of, of our loss aversion, of our irrational loss aversion? I mean, surely you had some, some of your own experience saying those same things to yourself, like, oh, envisioning the, the worst possible losses that could ever happen from taking a few mornings off to write a book. I mean, at some point, something had to convince you, well, that's worth it. And, and, and that, yeah, absolutely. And that thing was David Badanis. It was a friend telling me, well, he's a friend now. He was really just an acquaintance at the time. But what I found rather inspiring, telling me that, you know, I could do it. I didn't need anybody's permission. I should just get on with it. Um, it's interesting. I, I do sometimes remind David of that conversation, and he says, well, thanks very much, Tim, but I've had that conversation with about a dozen people, and you're the only one who ever went and wrote the book. So you know, it's, it's not just about the encouragement. You have to have it inside yourself. But one of the themes that comes out um, in the book, both, both in that little epilogue about our personal lives, but also, for instance, in the, in the chapter on the war in Iraq, is that good advice is essential. You really need a diversity of views. You need people who are going to be honest with you. Um, but, of course, they may be honest with you and they may be mistaken. So you, that's why you need more than one view. We often lack the perspective ourselves to figure out you know, what, the, what the opportunities in our situation are and what the risks in our situation are. So that's, a, that's a theme that comes up again and again. And, and David's advice to me, you know, why don't you just write the book? I mean, he gave me some tips as to how I might do it. But fundamentally, it was just, you can do it. Get on with it. David's advice to me is just a classic example of that, um, that external force, advising, criticizing, um, keeping us on the right track, telling us when we failed, where we have to go uh, to do better. Very powerful. Now, if we talk about this first book, The Undercover Economist, coming up to the ultimate test, you know, the, the market, which, as you say in the book, you know, the market doesn't care about you, but because of that, the market gives you the most honest feedback you're ever going to get. Now, this this gets you into an area that if we're talking about the intersection of economics and, and the way things are marketed, well, that's not quite the way to put it, but things in a market and biological evolution, you know, you can't talk about a biological evolution without a process, without talking about environments. You can't talk about an organism without talking about the environment in which it evolved or the environment in which it has to succeed or fail. And the undercover economist, uh, as I pointed out a little bit before, it seemed to me to come out, come out in an environment of, um, of, shall we say, a popular economics book boom, where people seem to be all at once very much into seeing books about that. So, you know, you wrote a book people still enjoy, but it also, do, do you think that, do you think that it got any, it, it got to ride a wave in a sense? Do, I mean, do you think a good book would have, it could, could have failed being the same book at another time? I, I, I absolutely uh, think, it, uh, think it could have done. I wrote the book before Steve Levitt and Stephen Dubner, the, the authors of Freakonomics, I wrote the book before they ever met each other. Right. 
And yet the book, because I had trouble publishing it, didn't come out until a few months after Freakonomics, and it, and it did tremendously well. I'm sure, uh, partly, possibly even largely as, as a result of Freakonomics, it was such a huge success. My book, there were various copycat books, but they were much later. My book would, appeared on the market. Freakonomics is still in the top 10. Everybody's talking about it, and suddenly there's a, there's a new economics book, and it seems, it seems quite interesting, kind of cool, and you know, there's this economic economist as detective figure on the front cover. And <laughs> so I'm sure the timing was, was very fortunate and very helpful. And, and I've experienced the flip side of that as well. So when my second book, The Logic of Life, was published, this is a book basically arguing that um, if we understood uh, this, ec- this economic idea of rationality, if we understood rational choice theory, it actually told us a surprising amount about the world. Um, it came out uh, just as the financial crisis was, was reaching a really severe moment. And the mood music was wrong. The world seemed very crazy. People weren't really ready for a book that said, actually, a lot of people are rational. And it also, uh, the business programs, which might ord- ordinarily have wanted to discuss my book, would just wanted to talk about the business news. So there was just less space available. So I had very good luck with one of those books and uh, not such good luck with the second book. And I, you just have to cope with that, I think. Um, context is always going to be important. Um, so that's partly about, well, you know, you just have to pick yourself up and try again. But there's also a, um, and I was lucky that, <laughs> I was very lucky that the, what, the order of the books wasn't reversed because, because it's much easier <laughs> if your first book is a success, you can keep going. Um, but it, it's not just luck. It's also a sensitivity to context is very important. So one of the, The points I make throughout the book is that there are certain people, um, I talk about this in the Iraq war chapter, I talk about it in the financial crisis chapter, the people who can see what's going on and react quickly, they are often not the people who are actually given the power. We we often give power to people at the top of hierarchies who may have some useful centralized information, but do not, in Hayek's words, have knowledge of the particular circumstances of time and place. Don't see what's going on, you know, on that battlefield, um, in the heart of that particular uh, credit default contract, or they don't see uh, the engineering failures on that oil rig. And so that's a major theme of the book, trying to get the information from the people who are there on the ground, giving them the decision-making power. Now, this gets at one of the most fascinating issues to me, which is the amount of information that a decision maker, say, and the, the, the person running this particular experiment, whatever experiment it might be, has it can be expected to have. How much information do can we really believe that, that they possess? Because, you know, you're writing The Undercover Economist, and you have no way of knowing that this book, Freakonomics, will come out and set off a boom of interest in economics. And that can't stop you, of course. If it did stop you, you wouldn't have the book out. You know, it's in a certain sense, correct me if I'm wrong, but I can I argue that you have to rely on maybe quantity of experiments because you cannot have the information to assure almost anything, it seems like. No, you're absolutely right, which gets us back, I guess, to, to where we were when we started the conversation, that trial and error is this tremendously important process. You can't sit there and predict what book will succeed or what product will succeed. You can try. You can do your best. You can do some market research. You can try and design something that's good and cheap and, you know, whatever, whatever business you're in. But in the end, the failure rates are tremendous. And for an individual, that may not be very comforting. For a, for a company, you can be more systematic about that. A publisher can publish a range of books. Procter & Gamble or Unilever can publish a range of uh, – can produce and market a range of different products and see which, what, what, what catches on. And one of the really interesting ideas that emerges quite early in the book is having made the case that the world is very complex, having made the case that failure rates are very high in the market, you get lots of firms going out of business, and yet, nevertheless, the market is producing lots of ideas that, that people seem to value. Um, so after those two points, the question is, well, to what extent is any of this predictable? To what extent can you get an edge 
or is it all just totally random? Is the, is the trial and error a completely random process? There's a very interesting statistical analysis by the economist Paul Ormerod, who compares um, economic extinction events where lots of companies go bankrupt with biological extinction events where lots of species go bankrupt. And he finds the same patterns emerging. And he argues, I'm just giving, I'm just giving the surface of this argument more sophisticated, but he argues it's, it's pretty strong evidence that a lot of corporate experimentation is pretty blind. We, we've got our chief, uh, chief executive officers, we've got our CEOs. Whatever it is that we're paying them for, it isn't being able to see into the future and see what products will succeed and what will fail because these, these failure rates seem to come almost entirely at random, just as they do in biology. Now, the, the issue of information, that, the, the ideas about information and how information works in markets, that is, that's an element of economics that, at least for me and for a lot of people interested in the subject, I would think, that's the part that makes it click. You don't really understand how markets work or why markets work as well as they do unless you understand what they do with information, whether you learn this from Hayek or, or whomever. And it's also what I hear from people who, I mean, this, this gets into the self-improvement territory, but people who, people who talk about why human endeavor gets stifled, oftentimes it's because of the people trying to do these endeavors, well, they, they think, I need more information, I need more information, can't start until I get more information. Ultimately, it gets to the point of needing to predict the future, needing to predict success, uh, needing not to do something until it's guaranteed a success, which just equals wanting more information than they can reasonably collect. Now, I want to get the sense from you, you know, if I don't get too deep into this question here, which... Um, what's, what is, is, is information, I guess, the common, the common thread here and the fact that we have to make peace with the fact that we can't have as much of it as we think we might, as we thought we might have needed before? If we're talking about futurology, it's hard to imagine any amount of information that would really let us effectively forecast the future. Perhaps if we also had unlimited computing power, we could do it, but, um, one of the points that I make in the book, and it has been made before, is really across almost any expert discipline in the social sciences, our, our forecasting is extremely poor. It's not just economics. It's, it's the full gamut. And it's not just academics. It's also more practical people such as uh, diplomats or spies or, or, or journalists. They're, they're all just terribly bad at forecasting events in, social, uh, in the social sciences it, because basically because it's too complicated. It's just too complicated. So I don't think more information is ever going to be the answer. Um, but we sometimes form the illusion that it is. And I think some of the, some of the quite poignant um, parallel in the book is between um, this idea in the U.S. Army. They have this thing called the Revolution in Military Affairs the idea that they could centralize information more and more at the, um, you know, with the most senior general. He would have everything at his fingertips. He'd be able to see everything moving on the battlefield in real time. His opponents wouldn't have a clue. And he could move his troops around like chess pieces. That is a, is a fantasy that is shared by, I think, many corporate chief executives. They see, they see all the Excel spreadsheets and all the PowerPoint slides, and they, they form the illusion that they actually really understand what's happening on the ground. And in both cases, that is an illusion. I mean, these things can clearly be helpful. There's nothing, nothing wrong with trying to get satellite images. It can be very useful. PowerPoint can be very useful, you know, generating information about what's happening in your business. But in the end, there are a tremendous number of interactions that are happening on the ground. Um, whether, I mean, I tell the story of a captain in the first Gulf War blundering into Saddam Hussein's Republican Guard, outnumbered 10 to 1. His tank brigade is outnumbered 10 to 1, and he's the guy who has to make the, make the decision. And he learned the lesson from that experience that actually decentralized adaptation was tremendously powerful. You needed the junior commanders on the ground to have the authority. I, make that, I take that case study, and then I compare it over with what happens in a place like Whole Foods Market, um, where 
fairly junior staff are given a lot of authority because they're there on the ground, they're meeting the customer, they see what the customers want, they're the ones dealing with customer questions. They actually need authority to be able to respond to the particular circumstances, to be able to buy local food and to respond to local tastes. So, yeah, information is, is we're never going to have enough of it. But the question is, given a limited amount of information, can you get it into the right hands? And the right hands are not always, but often, the people right on the ground. And finally, I don't, I don't want to sound too grand asking this, but do you, do you see signs of humanity learning this about information, learning that individuals may not be the best top-down, centralized, information-mastering decision-makers, that it, that it is time, perhaps, to decentralize? It's not clear, but let me give you a, a few hopeful signs. So uh, private foundations, large private foundations, uh, are, seem to be spending their money in a much more experimental way than governments have tended to do. I sympathize with governments. They're spending taxpayer money. They, they, they don't want to experience demonstrated, demonstrable failures. But foundations such as the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, proven track record of being very failure tolerant, funding a lot of failures, but funding some very big successes. The Gates Foundation, um, funding the advanced market commitment, which I discuss in the book, which is a kind of gigantic prize that has spurred the development of a vaccine for pneumococcal disease. Very, very important progress. So these foundations, they're being very experimental. If you look at corporations, Silicon Valley is a symbol of success. Silicon Valley is highly failure tolerant, highly pluralistic. Corporations in general, there's evidence that this is true, seem to be decentralizing. Uh, Raghu Rajan, a former chief economist of the IMF, did some work showing that it's not just a change in the job title. It just seems to be a general, a genuine decentralization of power in corporations. And a final example, randomized trials, that controlled failure, controlled error, it's been so powerful in medicine, finally starts to, seems to be getting traction in development economics and possibly in social policy uh, more often, uh, more widely. So, you know, I wouldn't say, uh, yeah, we've learned this lesson or we are learning this lesson um, because I'm sure there are steps backwards as well. But I can point to these specific areas for hope. I've been speaking with the undercover economist, Tim Harford, author of... Well, The Undercover Economist, The Logic of Life, and now Adapt. Tim, thanks so much for taking the time to come on the program today. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. If you'd like to learn more about Tim Harford and Adapt, visit Tim Harford, H-A-R-F-O-R-D, by the way, dot com. This has been the Marketplace of Ideas. I have been Colin Marshall. If you want to hear this show again, visit ColinMarshallRadio.com or head straight to iTunes. In either place, you'll get the complete Marketplace of Ideas audio archive, completely free, listenable on any device of your choice. The website of Ben Althaus, the man who makes our theme music is and has always been and will always be, I assume available at benalthaus.com. And if you want to sign up for the Marketplace of Ideas mailing list and get updates on all things MOI, current, upcoming interviews, older stuff, newer stuff, related internet interestingness, links to other cool stuff on the web, sure, why not? You can sign up on the Marketplace of Ideas homepage to use a 1996-y term. Call on marshallradio.com is the URL. Click the Marketplace of Ideas, how to sign up for the mailing list. That's there, right on the front Marketplace of Ideas page. Questions, comments, feedback of whatever kind, call on at callinmarshallradio.com is the email address. And stay here. Just wait. Just wait till the next week because... We'll have more Marketplace of Ideas on the way, more cultural conversation of the depth that you demand.